Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and uh, we have the Gritty Broman behind the camera. How are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. And we have Preston Ward as our guest today. Yeah. Preston, you own Mountain Physio, basically a uh, PT, physical therapy practice. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And you've been doing that for how long? So I've had Mountain Physio going for about a year and a half now. I did some podcasts recently. I have a few more coming out on basically a lot of physical therapy topics. Yep. We've known each other for a little over a year, I think. Yeah. Um, just because of our mutual relationship with the folks at Mountain Ops. You've come down to the gym. You've done some soft tissue, some dry needling on folks that come yeah. into the gym here, which is creepy as hell. <laughs> but you and I started talking through Instagram after I posted a few things on social. I'm sharing my personal experiences on the podcast and what has worked for me and what hasn't worked for me. My personal journey. I also shared David Goggins' journey and I'll share more of that. As we've you know engaged in discussion, there are things that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And you're a physical therapist, so you're the perfect guy to have on the podcast to expound on some of the topics that I've covered. Right. Uh, some of the things that I've said, you can kind of clarify or maybe put in context more. I hope this is really useful. I think it will be really useful to the audience. So that's the topic of today's discussion. We're going to get into some physical therapy things. We're going to talk about backs. And then we're going to try to keep having these shows uh, with Preston for a while yeah. as these questions and topics come up. So a lot of things guys are asking about, again, they want me to expand on the back pain issues. Mm -hmm. They want me to cover shoulder pain. I want to discuss with you calf pain mm -hmm. because that's been a kind of a problem area for me over the last couple of years. We'll see how far we can get into the discussion. We, we probably just have to do a few shows yeah, we will. and just get through all this stuff. Right. So before we get started, I want to remind people, check out our boys at Sissy Sticks. For some sweet track and poles, carbon fiber upper, aluminum lower, mm -hmm. really uh, great, excellent combination of, of performance and strength, mm -hmm. just, just right. Because mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to carry some heavy, heavy aluminum poles, and you don't want to carry some weak carbon fiber. This is a nice blend. Plus, they have the clip locks. You should hear Brian's tirade. It's not a rant. It's a tirade. Against twist locks. <laughs> I hate them. I, I need to get them. a pair of sissy sticks, actually, because... I was going to ask If you. I use code Critty, do I get a Yes, you discount? get a <laughs> discount. Yeah, you actually, I think they're like 115 and some change or something. 110.15, I believe. Because I, I did a little, um, I did a, what was it, like a, not a, not a podcast, but a mm -hmm. blog on yeah. um, some trekking poles and how, how effective they are and stuff. So how effective nice. are I need, they? I need to get some. I need, they're quite effective. <laughs> yeah. That's what I say. I, I'm, I'm shocked by people who still don't use them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the name sissy sticks be, was because this old codger that is, that was uh, kind of a mentor for Bryce, Bryce Bishop, the, Bryce Bishop, the owner of sissy sticks, kind of his mentor growing up, he got older and stuff and he had to start using mm -hmm. trekking poles. Yeah. And he'd always say, I got to grab my sissy sticks because he hated the fact that he, <laughs> he had to use, had to use them. But yeah. he's, he's like, you can't deny that mm -hmm. they, he's too macho yeah. uh, in the past. But as he got older, he's like, these things are critical. And I do, they, I used to have some statistics off my head on, right. on, and some of the loading, they reduce your, your load on your legs and, and the energy expended by some 40% or something dramatic. Yep. Uh, so you're, you're talking about, I just know from personal experience, you give me a pair of poles and you have me go up or down. It's, I can go down, I can go up and down w using far less energy, right. being far more efficient with my body. And think about it, two points of contact or four points of contact yep. when you're stepping over a log or a rock mm -hmm. or crossing a, a, you know, we've got some sketchy stuff. Especially some of the steep terrain that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, I could have used an ice axe when I was in New Zealand. I would have <laughs> gladly chucked the poles for something with a oh, better a, with a better arrest device. There's a few spots where I'm like, if I slide, I, I don't think I I don't have anything to stop me. Nothing to like just mm -hmm. dig into the snow oh. or the ice or the cliff there. And what's your wife think about all that? She did not like it, but yeah. uh, it won't won't happen again. I just I have you know I I don't know how we got ourselves into that mess. Jeez. Um, yeah. But, you know, what would hunting be without some adventures oh, like right. that? And now that I know, uh, we'll have all the right gear for those kind of situations. It's just not worth it. Or we won't hunt there. Yeah. When Ryan shot 
the the tar that gave us the most mm-hmm. trouble. When when he shot that tar, that was where we were really at some risk. Uh, it was the second bull he shot. Um, we I shot mine moments before his, and it was on a ledge, and we knew it would fall to us to a location that was mm-hmm. very easy to get to. And sure enough, I did, and it fell. Ryan's bull was just a little bit too high, and mm-hmm. we debated whether to shoot it or not. But it looked like if he shot it based on the terrain, it would be okay. Well, it fell the wrong mm-hmm. direction. Oh, jeez. And there was like a slot pocket canyon, and it fell <clears throat> 200 yards straight down? No, it was like 800 yards down the mountain and ro- flipped and then <laughs> soared like Superman and then just stuck in a uh, snow chute that was like eight feet deep of snow and it just went thunk and stuck. It didn't slide any further. Just <laughs> You could just see parts of it sticking out of the snow. It took us all day to find it. And then once I found it, I was like, whoa, it's way down there. Oh, jeez. And where we were looking for it was the sketchy part. When we Where, where it actually landed, it wasn't too bad. Mm-hmm. We were able to sneak around. There was one sketchy spot, but we were really cautious. We, we toe-picked in real deep. We basically made a, a cliff ledge walkway with snow. with snow to the tar. <clears throat> That's sketchy. <laughs> but having a little bit of a rope and some picks and some other things would have been... Mm-hmm so much safer. Sounds like you just need an attachment for your sissy sticks. That's but what I'm getting. Had right? we had we not shot that bull, that particular bull, or if we waited a day or two for it to move to a different location, which we were we had been doing that, we wouldn't have got ourselves into that mess and we're just wiser now. Yeah. That's so, what happens. Every hunt. Yeah. So let's get into this discussion. Let's get into this uh podcast here. I did the the back podcast, the yeah. one recently um slip disc. Mm-hmm. Which was a red flag, right? A little bit of a wait. What slip disc mean? Yeah, it, and it perks my ears up every time you every time you give a podcast. I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's good stuff. But we did no. the same thing with uh, <laughs> stretching. Can stretching save your life? Uh, how I fixed a slip disc? Things like that. It's colloquial, mm-hmm. and it's to get people's attention Absolutely. and to get them to check it out. And I even had a guy say, stretching doesn't help. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, well, we're talking about a holistic approach. Mm-hmm. It's it's just a term. That was part of the podcast, but not necessarily, you the, know, the sole subject. Yeah. Same with slip disc. We looked at mm-hmm. mo- the most common term and it said slip disc Yeah, when there was like five terms. Cause yeah. I said, you know, it's a bulge disc, a herniated, a herniated. disc, a slip disc, mm-hmm. like which, mm-hmm. what is this? And there was like, they all kind of shared the same definition. But you're the PT, so right. let's let's talk about this. Well, yeah, every time you say the slip disc, it just something inside of me just like <laughs> cringes. The reason why is because so the discs that sit in between the vertebral bodies. So a mm-hmm. slip disc is a great term for some layman's terms, right? Mm-hmm. If we're gonna say what it you know technically is, so whether it's a herniation of the disc, um, so there's different levels of herniations not with just in the spine itself, but also at that specific disc. So you could have a herniation, you could have a sequestration where there are different levels of that herniation. And so Mm -hmm. for instance, for that slip disc, it's, and the reason why I cringe when I hear that is because if you think of it and if people are like, well, I have my back and this disc just all of a sudden I did something and it slipped out of the way. Yeah. Like that doesn't happen. The spine is is one of the most stable parts of our bodies. That that spine doesn't just slip out of the way. And so <laughs> when I hear that and people hear that and and though it's great to use layman's terms and stuff like right. that, some people and I will say that on the more like on the clinical side of things that I see, people are like, I've had this slip disc for twenty five years and it's never gonna go back into place. Mm-hmm. Well, now this one term of using a slip disc has turned into 25 years of chronic pain. And so it's actually a, and that's why I jump on my soapbox here, Brian. Is yeah. I hear those things and I'm like, let's correct a couple. Let's correct yeah. a couple terms. Yeah. So. Yeah. I can, uh, <clears throat> same thing with stretching. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a few people, there was a couple guys that got on there and said, stretching is not good for you. And then you have the story of David Goggins explaining how, he didn't do stretching because everything he had heard was that it reduced your power and your performance. Right. And he wanted to be his powerful athlete. And so he didn't stretch for those reasons. 
fast forward to that point in his life where he had huge knots below the base of his skull and some on his hip flexors and stuff that were just re- in real bad shape. And <clears throat> he's like, yeah, now I stretch every day. Mm-hmm. And, and he actually had to stretch a lot to get himself healthy again. Now he used the term stretch, but he was talking about lots of things, right? you know, just, you know, working on mobility, bending his body, mm-hmm. trying to get soft some range of motion, work. doing soft tissue work, lacrosse ball, foam roller, other massages, things like that to try to get to where he could touch his toes again. Yeah. So the term stretching is kind of, it implies a lot of things. Yes. The question though is, can stretching save your life? That's the thumbnail. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's a clickbaity title. Yeah. But when you when you look at it in its context, you know it has a lot more. The title served its purpose. Obviously, some people <laughs> watched it. Yeah. yeah, but there are a lot of people who were like, "No, <laughs> oh, let's answer your question now." It should be like, "Could an ice pick save your life?" I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's probably <laughs> yes. That's what we should do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but let's talk about the back. Yeah. Podcast mm-hmm. and what I covered because you you and I offline talked about how for me the McKenzie method was a a game changer mm-hmm. okay also a standing desk huge yeah nice being able to get away from sitting constantly was was really beneficial for me so i want to talk to you about you know the methods that worked for me mm-hmm. you said that they're good for certain conditions but not for others right the McKenzie method robin McKenzie um came up with this mdt so um that method for treating specific type of back pain. And I would say that it is good. There are different scientists, different therapists, different doctors that have prescribed different approaches. You have um, some specific, you know, core strengthening, or you have um, a McKinsey approach where you're working on like some lumbar extension. That's what a lot of them Mm -hmm. that you did. was a lot of extension based exercises. So that could be extension or flexion actually. And so when, when we hear that one approach, like the McKinsey approach, it's good, but it's not the catch all for everyone because Mm -hmm. there are different, again, types of back pain. And if we look at the literature, um, that's the different literature that we have on back pain, you have people who have like this ridiculous symptoms or pain going down their leg or the sciatica stuff. Yes. Um, maybe that's what you were probably having, um, Not that much. Not that much. Mm -mm. Yeah. So that's where that approach has been really good for. Then you have people that respond well to traction, but that's probably later on that we would do. There are a few people who wrote in who said that was the change that changed their life. The traction. Yeah. I've heard Rogan talk about it extensively as well. Yeah. So, And, and for people, can you describe that real quick for people who don't know what traction is? Yeah. So lumbar traction is typically a machine that you sit on or lay on, I guess, and then it you'd have your, you'd have your core and you'd have your hips strapped in. And so then it's distracting your spine, mm-hmm. basically pulling it apart, apart there it's, for it, lack of, for those things. who watched Batman with Michael Keaton, <laughs> was it Michael Keaton? Yeah. The first Batman. Yeah. He's hanging upside down. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like that. It's, it's kind of like they hang you by your legs and, uh, and your spine then. Yeah. It goes into traction. It goes into traction, right? And so even so, using the using traction like that is like it's beneficial for some people. So when I did that, mm-hmm. it was intensely painful. Yeah, it, like 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 I couldn't stand it. So uh, it would um, like a little bit of traction, just just where you feel like let's say your your legs are strapped down you're on a table that's slightly angled downward and you just pull you an a little bit table? an inversion table yeah. yeah and they're sort of pulling on your arm a little bit or just that or if you just hang from a bar exactly you just hang from a bar and you just relax and kind of let your back hang it would cause me pretty intense pain right um now, now it doesn't, you know, mm-hmm. but then yeah it was it, it did not feel good it felt like I was doing some damage yeah yeah. So, I mean, people respond to it. Some people don't. And that's why you're having, you know, a, a specialist or that's what my background is. in. I was, I'm a board certified orthopedic specialist. And so having that background in orthopedics is mm-hmm. very helpful speci- specifically for this population. You know, the majority of people, if we look at the statistics, you know, 80% of people will have back pain in their life and 
the reoccurrence rate is quite high. And so whether you're using a traction, like a McKinsey approach, if you're looking at core strengthening, all those approach, nerve flossing, all those things are very effective, but they need to be for the right person. And that's why, you know, mm. getting throw this in there, but having an evaluation where we can say, you know, you fit really into this box, you'd respond better to the McKinsey approach uh -huh. um, versus, you know, you fit into the core stability approach or you fit into really this, you know, this box we'll say that has maybe higher psychosocial approach, you know, that where we need to address some of the psychosocial issues. Yeah. And that's an interesting. So tell me this, because <clears throat> when I went in to get, or have my back mm -hmm. worked on, right. Or to figure out why, you know, I was in such pain when I went to the hospital, of course I have to see a primary care physician first before I can be referred to any kind of back specialist and you go see them and they're like, okay, your back hurts. And so, then, so that depends on where you're at too. Mm -hmm. So most places now, like for instance, for here in the state of Utah, you don't need to have a referral just to go right to a physical therapist. Okay. So anyways. So this was back in the day and I, I had uh, insurance through Kaiser. And so, yeah. uh, uh, what is that? A G HMO. Okay. Right. And so then I had to go, then once I went to the HMO and did that there, there, I wanted to get an MRI or mm -hmm. something like I needed, I felt like I needed something done like you guys need to figure out what's going on here. And they're like, yeah, we're not paying for that until you've gone <laughs> to physical therapy. Right. And, and I, I'm like, well, how can you fix it? If you don't know what is wrong, they ended up uh, saying, nope, you got to go to two or three weeks of physical therapy where they just work with you for a while and then we'll come back and look at it. So I went to a physical therapist that they sent me to. And to be honest, the first physical therapist I saw wasn't very good. Right. And I did some things and, and it wasn't really helpful. And they said, we can't help you go back to the doctor. So I went back to the doctor and they did a scan, an MRI. And then they were like, um, yeah, we don't really see much wrong here. Really? There's a little bit of a bulge right here on your, down in my low back. And they said, there's a little bulge there. And that could be what we're looking, that could be the problem. And they showed it to me and stuff. And then they sent me to, so then I went and found a different physical, they're like, you got to go back to PT. So I went and found a different therapist that I think a few people recommended to me Yeah, that was in the network, got in contact with this, this gal. And she was really good. Good. We worked together like three, two, three days a week. I'd go do the things and then I'd go home mm -hmm. with homework basically. And right. I would do it at home. What was really eye opening for me was it was so stupidly basic. Yeah. I was like, really? This is going to help me. You want me to do what? Mm -hmm. Like just just arch my back backwards mm -hmm. from the, like, this is not going to change anything. Yeah. That's kind of my skeptical nature. Yeah, right. yeah, for sure. And so I went through her things and I didn't do the other things. Like she said, avoid all this kind of stuff and, but do this kind of stuff. And then I'd go back and at first it didn't seem like it was doing a lot. And then a month later, I'm like, wow, I feel, I feel pretty good. And I have to say that I think one of the issues that, that for me mm -hmm. was I, once I started going back that second time, I avoided sitting at all costs. Yeah. I've pretty much never sat down. Um, I had kind of figured out that every time I sat down, it just made everything worse and yeah. hurt. I also quit playing basketball that just, I had already kind of had to stop doing that. Yeah. I was just so wrecked. So I wasn't doing a lot of intense physical activity, but I was going through her you know, just do a plank, mm -hmm. you know, work on those stabilizer muscles, just do the back extensions and mm -hmm. things like that. And I never sat down. I rode the bus to work. I stood at a standing desk. Nice. I stood at every office, every conference meeting I stood and I was on my feet all day long. And as I did that week after week after week, I started to feel really good. All it took was one three hour car ride and I would be wrecked for two or three days. Yeah. The, and, and all it was, was the sitting. And so I knew that sitting was causing some really, really down negative effects for me. Yeah. And so, but combining that with her program it really helped, but the scan, the MRI, you know, we talked a little bit about that yeah, we did. offline. So talk, talk about that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's everyone's go-to. They, they wake up, they have back pain or they're lifting something, something and they have back pain. 
And they sit, they go immediately to the emergency department. Here in Utah, actually, we have quite a few physical therapists working in emergency departments to reduce the amount of inappropriate imaging that's done for that very you know instance. So people, that's the people's first thought is, you know, I have back pain. I need to have it. I need to have an MRI taken because we need to know exactly what's going on to fix. We'll it. say fix this. Yeah, but that's not. That's not the case because if you look at MRIs and you're a great example where they took an MRI and they said, yeah, it could be that. Maybe not though. Um, There's nothing ba- like that looked really wrong. N- nothing really wrong. Right. And so typically yet I was broken. You were, yeah, you were in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So typically those MRIs are reserved for people who are planning on having surgery or there's some specific loss of function. So if we get into it, like bowel or bladder function, so like you'd have some loss of control there. Mm-hmm. You'd have inability to maybe pick your feet up. So we call it drop foot, right? So yep. that would be a, that would be something that we would not like to have. So there are some specific motor symptoms that we look at. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then, and that's why, that's why it's so important to first go to a physical therapist where we can address some of these approaches like you know, doing some lumbar extension saying, Hey, you know, don't sit as much because that puts your spine into some flexion Mm -hmm. and your spine doesn't like flexion, but maybe someone else's spine does like flexion. And so that's why it's super important to go to a physical therapist first. But the imaging is really interesting because if you look at, um, I was pulling up some articles on using fMRIs, So a functional MRI, basically they have you in the MRI and they have some, you know, scans on your brain. And so when they say terms like wrecked or, um, <laughs> or herniated or degenerative. So we hear the mm-hmm. term degenerative disc disease a lot. What about bulged? Bulged, all those things. They actually created a higher, I guess, spike on this fMRI to trigger people's pain response. And so even just saying those terms can be bad. So when you get an MRI, an MRI is really good at, looking at all the soft tissue. Well, you get that MRI and they say, you've got these degenerative disc disease. You've got this going on at L4, L5. Mm -hmm. And and then all of a sudden what that does is it puts into people's... Psychological. Psychological, exactly, that they're saying, well, that's the issue. That needs to be fixed. And I'm not going to be better until that is fixed. And And it seems like a lot of people want a surgery. They do, yeah. Like, let's do this, cut it open, fix it. Yeah. It's it's not a car. No, right, exactly. Yeah. And if you <laughs> It's not a trans it's not a new transmission here. You can't just plug and play. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. If I mean if you look at the people who are having back surgery, like back surgery, I won't go against like the surgeons do great work and everything, mm-hmm. but it's meant for very specific people again, and the majority of people benefit from some sort of exercise, physical therapy, and really prognostically speaking if we're thinking like People who have those MRIs first mm-hmm. tend to have a much del- like a, a longer disability because of just the knowledge that they receive. So knowledge is power yeah. and they get this knowledge, but maybe they're not informed enough on it on what they can do. And so that's from my standpoint, like from a physical therapist standpoint, when someone comes in, like, let's do some physical therapy first, even though, and that, and I hate to hear what you, I'm glad you had a great second experience. I hate mm-hmm. to hear that people have these poor first experiences with physical therapy. And that's, and that's what happens. And people will say like, it just didn't work. Not so, every physician is the same. Exactly. Not every dentist is the same. Not every um, specialist is the same. Not every accountant is, is has right. equal talent yeah, and ability. True. That's where I firmly believe that a, a finding a skilled professional in any walk of life. Absolutely is worth every penny if you can find that person. Mm -hmm. If it's an attorney, because they're not all created equal. Right. And growing up in the in the uh, Kaiser permanente. Permanente, yeah. Lucky to have made it out. (laughs) To to grow up in that HMO kind of hospital world where I that's that's the insurance I had all growing up. Mm -hmm. My parents learned early on, especially my mom, if you wanted a good doctor at Kaiser, you had to keep looking. Like there's some there, mm-hmm. but a lot of them she felt were really not very good at all. You right. were just a number. You came in and they sent you out. Yeah, and it was a matter of working through different physicians until you found one mm-hmm. that was good. Then you stick with that one. I think it's true across the board. Not every person that 
that does a massage is yeah. good. Sports massage is good. Exactly. You might have to go to five, six, ten different places before you find someone really talented. Right. And that's what you want mm -hmm. is that talented person, that one that really fixes your problems, not the one that talks a talk or, you know, yeah. you, you find that person and it's worth it. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ways, there's multiple ways to skin a cat, right? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of different things that help different people and finding that is important. I'm just dead set against, in general, invasive surgery. Yeah. There's certain things I think just have mm -hmm. to be done through surgery or you can't fix it. Yeah. Like maybe a torn meniscus. No. I don't know. No. Okay. So <laughs> well, that's another, we need to have that discussion so, too. <laughs> so there's certain things I feel like perhaps maybe an ACL. Okay. Right. No, some, some, there's, so, there's, <laughs> there's some things that need a surgery and some yes, that you don't. Absolutely. I but for the most part, Brian's case that maybe he shouldn't be letting <laughs> surgery be on the table. <laughs> for, for the most part, I want to avoid surgery at all costs. I feel like there's so much that can be done through physical therapy. That should always be that first choice. Yeah. Often it's just, you know, it's there's no coming back. Yeah. The, once you've g gone invasive and you've cut things up and you've, let's say you've fused your vertebrae together. Yeah, we're talking lumbar spine. Yes. Lumbar spine. It's like, there's no coming back from that. It, you're right. permanently changed after that. And so, and I firmly believe that the human body is a lot more regener regenerative than people think it is. Absolutely. And so I, I think, you know, so something I haven't really talked about because it was of a lesser importance to me, at least at first with this bulge disc or herniated mm -hmm. disc thing that I went through and all the back pain, that wasn't the only thing that was an issue. One of the reasons that I didn't stand up was because I had this tailbone pain that was level 12 out of 10. Like mm -hmm. it was, yeah. it was awful. And when I sat down and it was really slow over years I just started to develop this pain in the tailbone area and didn't know why I just, but it just would get worse until it was really, really bad. And at the same time, I started to have the low back pain and the herniated disc and all this other stuff. And they gave me a donut is what they gave me to sit on. At first, I just carried that donut around and everywhere I sat, I sat with that donut. So your tailbone was kind of in the center. Yeah. So it didn't put pressure on the tailbone. And they said, you just got to quit putting all that pressure on the tailbone from sitting. That was a couple of years. You know, it was minor. The pain would come and go. and But then it got to where it was pretty bad. And then it got to where just sitting for a few minutes would aggravate it and it would stick with me all day. And it, it got to be like really depressing. Yeah, for sure. So the back pain thing kind of happened like in my low back around the similar time frame. And then it just superseded the tailbone by far. Mm -hmm. But as I got to fix fixing the low back, the tailbone thing got to be, um, it came back as a real irritation Yeah, and the standing was helping. And I can remember debating and looking up coccidia, co co is it coccidinia. Yeah, yeah. That thing, your tailbone. Yeah. yeah. And I started looking at uh, surgery for that and they have a name for it. Hmm. Or they basically cut you open. It's right at, right in your crack, yeah, your right. anus, yeah. and it gets real close. And they cut it open right there, which is not a clean part of your body to begin with. So mm -hmm. it's got all these risks. Plus, that incision in that area is hard to heal. Right. And there's lots of complications. And then it's your spine. Mm -hmm. It's still part of your spine, even though it's your tailbone, mm -hmm. which is kind of this leftover yeah. piece of evolution Last. that doesn't really need to be there, but is still there. Some people have a more pronounced one than others, right? but there's a surgery where they go and remove your tailbone, mm -hmm. the last little bit. And it had like a 50, 50 chance of making it a hundred times worse or making it go away. Oh, geez. Mm. I had a buddy who fell on a tent spike. They had to do that to him. They had to go in three different times. They went in there and then it got infected. Yeah. They had to go back in there and drain it, clean it out. Yeah. And it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Yeah. yeah serious. So I did a lot of research, talked yeah, right. to a few doctors and I was just like, I need this to go away. I can't, I can't do anything. I couldn't ride a bike without like feeling like I've been stabbed. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so painful, uh, sitting, even if I sat for 30 minutes, it was just like, it just shoot pain level 10. Yeah. So this is after the low back thing, but it didn't debilitate me. As long as I didn't sit, I was pretty good. 
So I decided I didn't want to do the surgery just because those odds are not good. Yeah, no, no. They're not good. And the nightmares, you read the forums from people who (laughs) – there's some websites and places you can go where people would put their results in. And it was a big comprehensive community, and Mm -hmm. I joined a forum and a club and a bunch of people who were having the same problem. And they're like, this is what I did. This That's where I found the moon saddle for riding a bike. I rode a bike to work every day, and it was about an hour ride each way. I did it for years, but – I think part of the issue was sitting on that saddle, aggravated it, sitting in the office, aggravated it. Well, they have a seat called the moon saddle that curves. The opposite. Oh, that's It's cool. kind of like a bench. Oh, it's An not, upside down It's view. not like that. No, no. It huh. curves. It's like a half moon. Okay. Uh, or a quarter moon shape. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the pointy part of the moon points back toward the back tire. Yeah. And when you sit on it, your sit bones just sit right Right on it. it. Mm -hmm. And as you pedal and your legs move, they don't, your, your legs don't hit the seat Mm -hmm. because it curves back. So it just, it, it's actually ergonomically, it's a genius design for touring and riding to work and everything. It was perfect. And I could ride my bike again without causing any issues. It takes a little more muscle to stay in the seat, which is actually good because you don't want to just sit on your bicycle seat. You want to have a tight core and you want to ride it properly. So it kept you honest. And I and at first it would fatigue a little bit, but then I got good stabilization muscles and I could ride that bike mm-hmm. really well. And so I was able to ride a bike again, which was important to me. Um and it didn't cause any issues with the yeah. tailbone. So but for a while there just when I sat on I couldn't ride a bike, it was just like it just hurt too bad. Um even any kind of pressure like that. As I continued to do the McKenzie method and those back extensions over time. I was getting to where I was really flexible and I could, could curve up really high. Nice. And then one day I felt my tailbone go pop <laughs> and shift like pop and then pain, all pain gone. And I was like, what? And so then I started walking around and doing things and then I would lay down and do it and it pop, pop, pop. And it got to where it would pop into place. Like that tailbone would, sh- I could feel it shift really down low yeah, at the bottom and it would pop and then all the pain would be gone. So then I just had to pop it into place. Like in the morning, by the afternoon it would come out, I'd pop it in again and I, and I continued to do those back extensions. And then after about a year or two of that, it just never came out of place anymore. Yeah. And to this day, I do tons of back extensions all day long when I'm just in the office, just in a standing, standing position, yeah. do it in the office. I do it at home. I lay on the floor. I still do those back extensions da- like daily, multiple times right. a day because I feel like for my back, it's, it's impo- it just is, needs it. That's what works. Yeah. That extension-based program is good for certain people. And I think well, what I wanted to mention so I have a lot of surgical, I have a lot of friends who are surgeons mm-hmm. and I think like our goal as physical therapists is to keep people out of surgery. Um, that's definitely one of my goals and my mission statements that you'll see. But, you know, I think a lot of surgeons, that's their goal as well. They want people, they want people coming into surgery who are going to respond well to it. And if we look at back surgery in general, since we're talking about that, someone who has back surgery, there's a pretty high likelihood of having a second back surgery within Mm -hmm. five to, you know, five to 10 years and then a third within another five to 10 years. And so you kind of get down, you know, the slippery slope. Now, again, I'm not going to debate that back surgery is bad because it is good for certain people, Mm -hmm. but the very first line of defense should be go to a physical therapist to try it out. If you don't get one that you necessarily jive with, Mm -hmm. go to a different one, go to a, I'm, a very big proponent of, you know, having these, um, board specialties. So I did a residency and did boards, you know, a board, um, I'm an orthopedic board certified specialist. And so going to those specialties who have had a little bit more extensive training in that, I think is very valuable. Um, yeah, my goal is to help people avoid that, but I think there is a very individualized program for each person. And that's why, having just a, just like going to a physical, a yearly physical to your primary care physician, doing that with a physical therapist probably is going to serve you very well. Here's another thing too, though. And I'm sure you experience this is there are people who like me that are dedicated to finding a way Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm, I got to fix this thing and I'm going to keep, I didn't just 
wait on my physical therapist to tell me what to do. Yeah, right. <clears throat> I still tried and did research on my own and still listened to what other people said was working for them. And then I talked to my physical therapist. It was a partnership. It was me yeah. doing my part, them doing their part, and us kind of working through it and trying to figure it out. And I think too often... We call that shared decision-making yeah. between clinicians and patients. Okay. Yeah. So I think too often someone goes in, they tell them what to do, they go home, don't do what they're told, mm -hmm. come back and say, you're not helping me. Mm -hmm. How often does that happen? Oh, I hear that. <laughs> it, it's I mean, not we have, working. There's statistics actually out there. I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but that the, the majority of people... You know, if you go to a physical therapist or you've been there, they'll maybe do some soft tissue work on you and then maybe they'll, you know, give you some exercises, your homework. Mm -hmm. The majority of people don't do that homework and they come back and they say, you know, I'm not feeling any better. Um, then they go right to surgery and then they have, and yep, then they that's have, that's what I was going to say. Then they have bad outcomes after surgery mm -hmm. because they expect surgery to fix Be this magic pill. This magic pill. It's exactly. the same thing with, hey, you, you're having some heart issues. Yeah. Right. You're probably overweight. You know, you need to, change your diet. Here's your homework. Mm -hmm. And then they keep doing what Which they're is doing. Exercise based. Yeah. And then they just want statins for their high blood pressure exactly. and, or, or for their high cholesterol, <clears throat> cholesterol yep. and, and so on. And, and, uh, we just live in a society that's a lot like that. We do. But if you really want to be healthy and strong, you have to own it. You have yeah. to take accountability. It's up to you, not your physical therapist, yeah, not right. your doctor. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's you, yeah. you, you, you've got to find a way. Yeah. And, and there, there's resources out there and there's mm -hmm. people out there, you know, have that expertise who are willing to help with that. So, yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask again, like for me, when I did the, you know, when, when I had the tailbone pain and started mm -hmm. working through that, it was not an overnight fix. Okay. The buildup of the pain was subtle, so subtle that it, it, it took a few years. Yeah. And I ignored the red flags early on because I was like, Eh, it's not that bad. Uh, it's probably just soreness or mm -hmm. what until it got to a point where it was so bad. It was hurting me and bothering my life every day to the point where I con contemplated surgery. And then from the peak of that to the recovery was another two and a half to three years of slow improvement. Mm -hmm. So this was a six year, five, six year part of my life. Right. And I think a lot of people, go to the surgery and it took me, I thought about it, you know, it took me years to wreck it. You know, it might take me years to years rehab. to fix it. Yeah. To, yeah. Exactly. So I need to have patience. I need to understand it's not a destination. It's a process and just do my things that I know are probably going to reverse the problem. Right. What got me here in the first place, I quit doing those things and then I started doing things that would help it improve faster. And I just, I just think too often people, uh, they want results right now. Yeah. They want results today. They don't want to put in the work to get there. They don't have yeah. the patience. So they elect for a surgery and it's a, sh it's a band aid. It's a short term fix mm -hmm. because the underlying issue that caused you that problem and that is still there, you didn't fix, mm -hmm. you know, when I had all my back pain, I, I don't, you know, just because the disc was bulging a little bit to get in there and then shave the disc or do something to it that doesn't fix my posture didn't fix my back strength. My so what got you into that? What got yeah. me into the problem in the first yeah. place? And that's my one of my things I, I worry about. Unless you've had some kind of catastrophic injury, you're in a car wreck, right? And something happens where you need a surgery to fix some things. To me, it's like if you got there through movement and motion, get out of it through yeah. movement and motion. Exactly. Uh, and if it doesn't work after all of that, then I think surgery maybe that's the right solution. I just think. Put in the work first yeah. because the, 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 everyone I know that's had surgery, whether it's a knee or a back or something, mm -hmm. they've had to have it over and over and mm -hmm. over again. And it's been a, it has been a curse their whole life. Yeah. And it may not be that specific surgery that they've had over and over again, oftentimes like with back surgery, mm -hmm. but it'll it's be a different, the next level. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, I mean, you say like it's, it's about movement and ultimately if we look at people who have back pain, it's about keeping people active. It's about keeping them moving. It's about keeping them, yeah. you know, doing aerobic exercise is a really good thing, strengthening. Um, but it's about staying active and, and not relying on some of those passive modalities, someone doing, you know, something those are, those feel good 
Traction yeah. feels good, but if you're just going to sit there, like it's probably not going to be as beneficial as going and doing some exercise or, you know, having a massage feels right. good, but do some exercises. That's yeah. Better. That's, that's why I've said I like to have a massage Yeah, and then I like to work out mm -hmm. right. Like in conjunction right. and then do a massage and then work out and do a massage and then work out. And when I say massage, it's like, I'm stretching and moving. Yeah. It's like Tai Chi or something where they're digging into the muscle while it's mm -hmm. in traction, right? which hurts like hell. But, but it's, it's the movement, you know, they say motion is lotion, mm -hmm. you know, it's, <laughs> it's the movement. It's like people say, Oh, it hurts. So I don't, I just don't do it. I'm like, man, if mm -hmm. you want to overcome it, you kind of just got to keep moving. Yeah. So my buddy, Anthony Spencer, yep. you, you I met know. Anthony. Uh -huh. So he's had severe yeah. issues with his back and it's gotten worse. And he's had a surgery or two mm -hmm. on his knees and his back. But he's at this point in his life where the only thing that really helps is exercise. Is exercise, yeah. But it's so intensely painful and 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 life debilitating. It's the movement though mm -hmm. that gives him relief now. Yeah. But not at first. Mm -hmm. At first when he moved, it was just a problem. It hurt. Mm -hmm. But now he's like, if I do deadlifts, if I do some rowing, and then if I go and do some exercise, and if I'm if I keep walking and moving, then I don't have pain. That's what he said. Is there was a time where he couldn't get up, couldn't move, mm -hmm. but then he found he could row a little bit, mm -hmm. and then as he was started to row, it started to loosen up and feel good. So he would just spend the first bit of his morning every day just rowing, so he could get up and walk, just around. so he could function. And now it's like the movement is what keeps him healthy. Mm -hmm. When he has to sit in a truck and drive around and all day, up, does, yeah. he's just wrecked. And that's what got him. I'm I'm sure we 100%. just did that that podcast called Desk Bound, mm -hmm. where we read Starrett's book on that. Right. And I just don't think people realize how when when he says when they say you know sitting is the new smoking you know mm -hmm. I think there's more way more truth to that than oh, yeah. people realize. And so someone like Anthony. You know, having sat in a vehicle for eight, ten hours a day with a gun on your hip that mm -hmm. puts you lopsided yeah. in the car with gear on as a police officer, you, you sit like that all day, every day for years, and that's where you spend most of your time, you're, you're going to have some problems over yeah. time. If you spent your whole, a lot of your life like that. And so, especially, I feel like sometimes it's even worse for those that are extremely active mm -hmm. and then to also do that. It's almost mm -hmm. like either become completely inactive and sit around or you're better off. I don't yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm not a proponent of that. <laughs> but the other one, uh, my buddy, so Anthony works through motion is critical. Yeah. But I have another friend who has had severe tailbone pain like I experienced and he almost got the surgery a couple of times. And he'd gone over and on. I'm like, don't do it. It's just don't a bad do it. place. Just, you can't even get back there and clean it. And he's like, well, it took me years to get, you know, wrecked. It, it, again, it was a process. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it could take you years to get it fixed. You know, I wouldn't opt for a surgery until you're three or four years in. But it was so bad yeah. that, you know, he was on painkillers and other things because it was just so hard to function. Right. And he had a standing desk and he wasn't doing... It just wasn't getting better. Yeah. And for him, they installed a device that sends an electric signal. Mm -hmm. It like blocks the transmission of the pain signal. Oh, pain, yeah. Because as they look at it, they're like, we can't really see anything wrong. Mm -hmm. exactly. There's just this loop. There's this pain thing. Yeah. And so they installed that thing. And now it's to the point where after, I think it's been a couple of years now, mm -hmm. he's He's got his life back. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a topic that we need to, we need to sit down and... <laughs> do you believe in TENS units? Do you and think that they do Is that much? what it's called? So, no. I mean, there is a, there is a dorsal root um, like stimulator, actually, that they will put it inside. So, within the spine itself, we have... This is where it gets complicated. Is, is pain Lay in, it on me, Doc. Is, is pain in general is very very complicated. So it's, and what I mean by that is it's psychological, it's physical, it's emotional. There's a lot of different variables that affect, you know, our pain in general. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that can be very difficult. So people, people who have had this, you know, persistent pain for a long time, 
sometimes some of those simulators can be good because what it's doing is interrupting the, interrupting pain, the feedback, the electrical loop, signal that's right? going to the brain saying, cause the, cause the electrical sing- signal going to the brain is saying, Hey, there's some damage. The reason why we have our pain response is it's our body's mechanism of trying safety to, of trying to protect us. Exactly. Yeah. You put your hand on a fire. You need to know that it's burning you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. And then the next time you put your hand near the fire and you're not even on the fire, you you're sim- going to pull it away and you're going to be like, Oh man, Oh wait, it's not, it's not that hot because that's, that's your body's way of trying to protect you. And if you can't feel pain. You're going to get hurt. Yeah. Like you, you can sit there and chew on your lip after you've been to a dentist and then you're only like, to oh, find out oh, that, man. yeah, you've really messed yourself up. You need pain. Yeah. So to answer the, the tens question, like that's, that's a great example of interrupting that feedback loop. Mm-hmm. That's one of the theories there, um, but interrupting that feedback loop. And so they can be beneficial. More probably we see mm-hmm. research that supports that for the short term versus long term. It really. got him off of opioids and got him great. off a lot of things, that which which were really starting to control his life. Yeah. And that's, know? and that's ultimately scary stuff. Yeah. That's why, yeah, that's why we as physical therapists, speaking collectively, that's what we want to try to do is keep people off of those opioids. Now they have their, they have their purpose and Mm -hmm. you know, they're needed for sure. But it's that surgery that we need to, I think, be careful with because some people just have these expectations that this surgery is going to fix everything and take away all my pain. I I can't, every single person I see has had back surgery. I'll ask them, like they'll usually come into me, you know, a year or two later and they're like, I still have this problem. I'm like, well, is no, is the, is the tingling, is the numbness going down your leg? Has that gone away? Well, yeah. Then it was an effective surgery because that's ultimately what it was there for. Not necessarily to reduce the pain. What have you been doing for your pain? And they'll say, well, nothing. I just sit at home because I can't do anything. Well, that's why the aerobic exercise, that's why the cardiovascular, the strengthening, that's where, that's where, that's what we need to do is exercise. I have a lot of friends who have hurt themselves through bad motion or bad movement or lack thereof, gotten a surgery, it was better, but then they were back in the same boat six, nine months later because they really didn't change anything. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Back to what we were talking about, like, what got you into this? Let's not just do something to say, let's put a Band-Aid on it. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, I mean, the whole... There's the term that we use in healthcare, um, pain science or psychosocial approaches, cognitive behavioral therapy, lots of different. So as a clinician, that's what I do a lot of is, you know, education in people. Mm -hmm. And if we look at, I keep going back to this because there was a recent article in 2018 by Lynn et al. And they talk about the current, the con- the consistent recommendations across musculoskeletal pain conditions. So across anything from after a car accident, you have some whiplash all the way down to some foot pain, um, <laughs> consistent recommendations. And the majority of it talk about this, this, um, approach here that we see that says the shared decision-making and screening patients to, um, who have a higher likelihood of serious red flags. And so that's why as a physical therapist, that's why it's so key to go to a, you know, to a physical therapist who can do that screening Mm -hmm. and say, look, you don't need an MRI because if we get an MRI, then that's going to cause some more issues down the road or they, or you do some screening, like a patient comes into me and I see some of these red flags. I say, Hey, we got to get you actually over to the surgeon and talk about this sooner than, than later. And so there's that shared decision making between the patient, but yeah, yeah. Super fascinating. Pain itself is, is fascinating. And it, and it, and it's, and it's interesting from a, um, a PT's perspective, because I think one of my professors said, you know, that we as a profession have the ability to, for lack of better terms, really wreck someone's life by just using some of the terms that we use. Yeah. By saying like the terms I use all the time, like the terms you use all the time, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> We're just colloquial folk. Oh yeah, okay, that's fine. That's why you have me on here. No. Yeah, no, we I, never profess to be experts. Nope, nope, but no you have expert good content. You have great content yeah. to help a lot of people. But I, I, I go back to and like we were talking, like having it very patient specific. Right, you it worked for you. That one approach worked for you. It may not work for someone else. Like, right. Invest in yourself. and Well, that's how I feel somewhat about stretching as well. Uh, or even like you see it in diet as well as in exercise mm-hmm. that 
every individual is unique. Yeah. Different, different set of issues, different body, especially in diet. Gut biome is different. You know, what one person is deathly allergic to, another person might thrive on as right. part of their diet, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. What when someone might really thrive on a keto type of diet, another person can just suffer on that diet. They yeah. need, maybe they need a higher carb type mm-hmm. of diet. It is unique to the individual. And and the older I get, the more I've realized that. In fact, I heard uh, Rob Wolf, the author of The Paleo Solution, who's mm-hmm. someone I followed years ago. He was just so heavily keto and it, it changed yeah. his life, saved his life, mm-hmm. improved his health so much. Um, but he's like, if my wife eats like I eat, she feels like crap. Yeah. Yep. If and I eat like carbs. she eats, I'm wrecked. Mm-hmm. And he said on a Rogan podcast, I think it was, he, he said, the older I get, the more I have come to realize that there is no one size fits all diet yeah. mm-hmm. that you've got to understand you. So things like doing an elimination diet where you remove certain parts of your, maybe you strip your diet down to three or four things. Right. And then you slowly, and it's very bland, then you slowly add in maybe some different things like nightshades, mm-hmm. or maybe you throw in, you know, some, some dairy or something. And you see how you react after you've been on this elimination diet for a while and you start adding pieces in and you start feeling like, okay, well, I really do well when I eat like this. And when I eat these things, I feel, I feel suboptimal. I feel yeah. sick or I don't, I don't respond well. And, or I gain a lot of weight or it makes me hungry and I want to eat more all the time. I don't feel satiated. Like you start messing around with it and you start to feel, you start to learn, okay, these are the foods and this is the type of diet that I really respond well Mm -hmm. to. And this is the diet I don't respond well to. For me, intermittent fasting, it's not even that. It's just, I don't eat until one or two o'clock every day. I have zero interest in eating in the morning. I'd feel fine. I feel really good. I go into ketosis, some form of it, probably when I go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. And then from the from one or two o'clock till eight o'clock at night, I eat whatever I eat and then I don't eat anymore. Yeah. And that those moments of having an empty system, I think is really healthy for me. I respond mm-hmm. so well to that. And I feel like crap when I eat in the morning, eat in the mm-hmm. afternoon and I eat in the evening and I have a three course mm-hmm. meal day. I feel like crap yeah. all day long. Now that's me, but someone else, man, they might, if they don't like my wife, she doesn't eat in the morning. Stay away. She's a wreck. <laughs> you know? My wife, man, she I, I keep snacks on me. There's always a snack in my backpack. And yeah. I just periodically when, when I come home or I'm out and about, I just know I just got to throw it at her and just step back and let her eat it for a minute. <laughs> well, the same thing is true. Just throw it at her. The same don't thing is get true. too close to a crazy The same animal. thing true <laughs> is true with like what we're talking about with, with exercise. With exercise. Yeah. Uh, I remember watching some gals come into the CrossFit gym mm-hmm. and – you know, my muscles are wired tight. They're like steel cables. They're my, my motion is really limited Mm -hmm. and I have to, I have to put, I need a 400 pound. I need, I need a heavy bar on my back to load the load, the tissues. I need to load it in order for me to even stretch. Like they don't want to move. You put a really flexible gal on there who can, who's like a yoga Fiend. Fiend. <laughs> and you put a bar on them and their whole body's like a noodle. They go into hyperextension. Their back goes, I'm like, I can't even move my back in that position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as they come down, they're having trouble because they're so flexible that their body just goes all over the place. Yeah. I am not in that boat. For them, I'm like, <laughs> no. I'm like, your back is completely bent backwards. Your hips are so wide. Like you need to tighten that up Mm -hmm. and for them it's a completely different challenge compared to me and so the sort of things that i'm going to thrive on they're going to need the exact opposite of to to really respond well and so everybody is unique yeah and that's Mm -hmm. and that's why um it's pretty cool as as a physical therapist getting into this the hunting industry will say Mm mm-hmm I did not see a physical therapist trying to address this. There were a lot of good approaches, but a lot more like we were talking about of these, Hey, here's a program. This'll, this'll help you get through that. Or, Hey, here's the program for you where my approach is a little bit more like, let's, let's individualize this. Let's, you know, as a physical therapist, what's cool is we're, I guess, classified as, um, 
movement experts, right? So that's mm-hmm. that's the main that's the main thing that we're looking at when we're doing a lot of treatment is how is someone squatting? How is someone moving? How is someone drawing back their bow? How is you know how how are they doing all these things? And then let's address the mechanics. You know, so you talk about your body type versus you know this very flexible mm-hmm. you know woman at the at the CrossFit gym, like two different and probably need two different approaches to, to the, to their, yeah. to their rehab. Yeah. Which is, I think another thing that, sorry, that we just don't see a lot of in jumping into this industry, into this realm. Everyone's about like, we got to train all year round, mm-hmm. which I think we do. And I think that's, what's so cool. which it draws me into this is it's more of a lifestyle. Yeah. You've made it your lifestyle, you know, yeah. you hunt, put on 90, plus days or so of some severe terrain and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. We also need to think of the rehab. Everyone's trying to just like, let's train, train, train. I think there's a rehab approach to that, or maybe like a off training approach that doesn't really get addressed. That's probably another issue and another topic one day, but yeah. um, Very interesting. Well, there's still a lot to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're we've, we've been shooting the breeze for a little over an hour. So we're going to wrap this episode up, but we're going to get back. We're going to cover dry needling versus acupuncture. So we can answer Brent's question on that. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about some soft tissue type of things that you might recommend yeah. people, you know, do on a regular basis. I'd like to kind of get your insight on that. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about stretching yeah. in general or at home, you know, things that people, you know, or things that people should be doing maybe that does is more universal. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody should try this and maybe things that are not. Yeah. Um, get into some shoulder discussion. Absolutely. Um, knee, I, again, calf. So we have lots to cover. Yeah, we do. We'll do that in, in, uh, the next few episodes. So check that out. Uh, where can people find mountain physio? So my website, mountainphysio.com, um, on, on social media as well. Is it spelled mountain M T N P H Y S I O. So like mountain physio, mountain ops, kind of like mountain ops or okay. a lot of the other mountain, mountain. stuff. <laughs> okay. So mountain physio dot um, com, mountain physio dot com, yeah. and it's also mountain underscore mountain mm-hmm. underscore physio on on Instagram, yeah, mm-hmm. on Facebook I'm there as well. We'll have links to all those in the description. Yeah. Okay. Get on there. There's a lot of information on what I do, what I treat, um, different uh, methods of treatment. So a lot of telehealth is really big now and yeah. in our day and age. And so there's a mm-hmm. lot of services that way and video consults and even some free stuff that I have on there. So, yeah. So folks, if you, if you live in the Utah area or even if you're, you want to get some remote help, mm-hmm. they can get, they can get in contact with you at mountain yeah. MTN physio.com. Check that out. Link in the description field mm-hmm. of this video on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can always find our YouTube channel through our website, briancall.com. And, uh, that, that should be it. Check out, uh, sissy sticks, do us a favor, mountain ops. Don't forget about win yourself a razor, a razor. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, of course, Heather's choice. We've got Get deals pack-a-roons. with pack of runes that we got deals with, uh, who else we got seek outside, seek outside. your shelter needs, your backpacking needs mm-hmm. and, uh, Graxall game bags. So Valkyrie Arch. there's always look at the links in our description field for, for, uh, if you're out there shopping for some stuff. And if you have any questions, leave notes in the comment, leave questions in the comment field on the YouTube video. We like to get there or send us some, some DMS and Instagram mm-hmm. post there. That always works. So thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.